Dr. Barbara Byers, and I'm a counselor in the Dallas-Fort Worth area. And this is the first of 13 videos concerning the voices of the soul. Each video will be about 40 minutes long, and I'm going to talk about the capacities of our soul, the will, the emotions, our rational mind, the imagination, and so on. And I'm going to talk about how we come into formation of each voice, how we sometimes miss that formation, and how we come into transformation in the Lord. Jesus is the lover of our soul. He loves us. He understands everything about us because He created us. And all power is His already to change and heal us. So that should give us great hope. And I want to begin by declaring to you the wonderful love of God, so vast, so high, so deep, so wide, so powerful, so unending. It will never fade. He is always searching and always drawing us. God is never indifferent to us. We are not orphans. We are His beloved children. And um, His love isn't going to dry up. He's going to keep coming after us and He's going to keep drawing us to Him. His attributes are so wonderful. He is so full, not just of power and greatness, but of mercy and loving kindness toward us. And His love is here with us now, right now. And uh, He is just waiting for us to acknowledge that and to receive Him. First John 3, 1 says it this way, See how great a love, what an incredible quality of love the Father has bestowed on us, that we should be called the children of God, and such we are. His love is the greatest reality we are ever going to know and that we'll ever experience. It is so strong and so pure, so mighty, faithful, full of promise, full of restoration, undiminished in the face of our sin and our weakness. He's passionate in his pursuit of us. He is untamed like Aslan. He's penetrating and he is captivating. P.T. Forsyth wrote that God's love is the outgoing of His holiness. And Gardini in his book, The Lord, wrote, He is the living one, the close one, the one forever drawing near in holy freedom. He is the lover who not only operates, but specifically acts in love. And His act of love is to free us. We're no longer orphans. We're no longer outcasts. We have been ransomed by His blood and by His love. And we can be confident today that He really does see us. He really does know us and He really does know the places in our soul that need healing. Psalm 139 says, Oh Lord, You know everything there is to know about me. You perceive every movement of my heart. You understand my every thought before I, it even enters my mind. You are so intimately aware of me, O oh Lord. You read my heart like an open book. You've gone into my future to prepare the way, and in kindness you follow behind me to spare me from the harm of my past. Wherever I go, your hand will guide me, and your strength will empower me. Theologians call this prevenient love. Pre simply means before or going before. So before we ever had a need, before we ever um, even knew we had a need, God, God has already gone before us. He has already prepared the cross and the resurrection. He already has goodness that He is extending toward us. Prevenient also means producing a sense of anticipation. So we really long to experience His goodness. Psalm 23 talks about the goodness of the Lord following us. He is so very good and He wants us to know His goodness. And He's put that desire in our heart to know His goodness. And so He presses into us with His goodness. In Psalm 59, 10, His promise is that He will meet us in this. My God, in His loving kindness will meet me. That's our promise, that's our assurance that in these 
uh, 13 times of meeting together, He will meet with us. His love meets us, draws us, and then compels us, sometimes uncomfortably, to change and to be transformed and become like Him. So I just want to begin with a question here. Do you really know His love? Have you really received His love? Do you know that He is love? Why don't we just pause right now and ask Him to show you more of His love? Sometimes we've tasted a bit, but we need more depth. We really, really need to know that we're the beloved of the Lord. Just ask Him, Lord, reveal yourself to me in these teachings. Reveal your love to me and meet me in this. That's a prayer He will love to answer. So the soul. We're going to talk about the voices of the soul. Since Christ died for us, our very being, who we really are, He wants us to value who we really are. He wants us to value our soul. And often we don't understand the components, the organs of our own soul, the faculties and the energies within us and how they all work together. And so we just really fail to understand how to grow, how to heal, how to thrive. And I wanna help with that understanding and I wanna bring clarity to the true voice of our soul so that we can express it. So scripture talks a lot about the soul and refers to it in both the Old Testament and the New Testament. The primary Old Testament word that's used is nephesh. And uh, according to Young's Analytical Concordance, it's translated as soul hundreds of times. The Hebrews saw the soul as the central idea of the whole person. For instance, in uh, Deuteronomy 26, 16, we're exhorted to love the Lord our God with all our heart and with all our soul. That's not really a conjunction. Those words are used interchangeably. So it could read, love the Lord with all your heart, with all your soul. And then when we look in the New Testament, the word for soul is suke. We get our word um, psychology from that. And it's used among many places in 1 Thessalonians 5, 23, where Paul said, I pray God your whole spirit and soul and body. And I believe he's referring to our tripart nature, the very deepest part of us is our spirit. The soul, which we'll be talking about these weeks, uh, is the central idea of who we are. And then of course the body is the exterior that meets the, that meets the world. So it's not that we have a soul, like it's some baggage we're carrying along, but that we are a soul. Dallas Willard said, the soul is that aspect of your whole being that correlates, integrates, and enlivens everything going on in the various dimensions of the soul. It is the life center of the human being. And I'm gonna pull that apart and talk about the various dimensions, but it's our life center. So to refer to the soul is to use a very concise word that expresses just the unity of all of our inner powers. Leanne Payne wrote of the soul as the center from which emotions, thought, motivations, courage, and actions spring, the wellspring of life. It's, it's our whole personality, it's our whole personhood. It's what makes us a distinct, different person, definite person. And our soul is a gift that God has given us and He wants us to value that so we can be ourselves. And we need to care for this gift that He's given us. King David declared it this way, and you'll be familiar with this, Psalm 103, 1. Bless the Lord, O my soul, and all that is within me, bless his holy name. And again, we could just translate that, bless the Lord, O my soul, all that is within me. So all that is within me is sort of a shorthand phrase for what, what is the soul. It's all our inner powers, all our capacities, all of our faculties, such as the rational mind and the will and the conscience and the emotions and so on, overlapping and working together. These parts aren't fully distinct and separate, but it will be helpful to look at them separately and then see how they function together 
kind of like an anatomy. And um, really, we can't grow and mature in the things of the Lord unless we're letting him deal with what's in our soul. Jesus is the one, Revelation 2 says, who searches our mind and our heart and knows everything within us. And as we grow and experience real transformation, we become mature and full and complete. Our God becomes the center of our being, literally indwelling us, moving within us. Now just stop and think about that for a moment. That is incredible, that we have the real God really inhabiting us. He is the source, the living vine from which we draw our life. From that deep central place, He radiates up through our entire being, through our entire soul, and He grants us holy emotions, holy intuitions, holy thoughts, and so on, transforming everything within us. So from that deep central place, His life is coming up through us. Our whole place within is because He lives within us. Whatever wholeness we have is because of Him. Jesus is at the very center of our being. And the more we understand and practice this truth, the more we practice His presence, the, the more we mature. It's His presence within us. So how do we specifically let the Holy Spirit move in our transformation while trusting Him with our weakness and our brokenness and all the ways we're even just disappointed with ourselves and with others. Well, it's by welcoming Him, the one who lives within, into every part of our soul. We ask Him to come and form within us what hasn't been properly formed or to reform what's been misformed or malformed and to create in us what's lacking and bring to fullness anything that's dwarfed. Um, and this is the crux of these teachings, that Christ dwells within us in the deep central place of our being, and He initiates that transformation. Every part of our soul then can be filled and healed. Our spiritual life is formed in this atmosphere, and it's an atmosphere of awe and wonder because it is resurrection life within us. In all of our imperfections, He's present, and He's greater than us, and He's building something wonderful that looks like Jesus, that looks like Him. You know, we forget, but He likes being with us in the struggle. He really likes being with us. His grace keeps drawing us in, and He, he is in there with us. He doesn't stand apart from us indifferently or waiting for us to get better. He enters into that with us. But we do have to stay in the process. We do have to persevere, and we have to believe and practice His empowering presence. This isn't about self-improvement. This isn't about running our own life. It's about Him entering and doing what only He can do. In our striving, sometimes we just sort of want Him to come alongside and help us. But He is interested in so much more than that. He's interested in transforming us. He will always help us, but He's interested in us dying to the old and rising to the new, the real life within us. And you know, wonderfully, He has already transformed the deepest place within us. We've been saved. We have been saved and He entered us because He paid the price on the cross. And then He rose again and we now have a resurrection living inside of us. Uh, deep inside, we're born anew. And this is just sheer gift from Him, isn't it? And so we enter that with gratitude and with awe. But our salvation is just the beginning where we take our place with Him in His death. We, de we declare the old person goes to the grave and we rise anew in the power of His life, ready to be His disciples and filled with His life. But there's often the rub <laughs> because how to make that a continuing reality so that His life is always evident within us is, is our fight, right? While we now have the capacity to live abundantly, we're at first just newborns and we are needing to grow. We're needing to mature. We're needing to develop. The capacity is there. The wonderful possibility is there. 
but the development is not yet there. And in God's order of creation, development is always necessary. Just, just look how our physical bodies have to develop. So God wants to enlarge our capacity to know him in this development so we can mature and thrive. And in order to do that, he is going to have to reveal to us what hinders us. It's like rocks just below the surface of a river. We don't always see those subterranean things, but they hinder us and it's necessary for him to reveal that. We have propensities to all sorts of things, to jealousy, to lust, to self-protection and self-preservation, to um, um, self-promotion or anger or pride. And we have all kind of old patterns in the ways we respond. He wants to change those very things and he empowers us to do just that. Uh, but it means we don't try to fix ourselves. Instead, we die to our old ways and come alive to his by collaborating with the work of the Holy Spirit who's doing this within us. And the good news is that he does this with such mercy he doesn't do it in ways that debilitate us or in ways that dishearten us, but rather he unfolds to us in mercy, our real condition. And then we get to say, oh yes, Lord, I see it, I repent. Uh, our soul may become so fragmented from pain. Proverbs 25, 28 talks about a city broken into and without walls. And our soul can be like that, just broken into and without walls and we have these unhealed memories and then because of them we receive messages of rejection and of um, unworthiness and lack and hopelessness and powerlessness that silence our real voice. But He is able to heal the deepest pain. He is able to bring to life what has been paralyzed in our emotional well-being and what has stifled and stymied our spiritual well-being. He enters our sin-marred memories with His presence. He brings His light. He brings His healing so we can be restored. Where our hearts were wounded, we formed all sorts of our own truths around those wounds. And then we made choices in responses to those experiences. I'll talk about this in a, in a, a later video, but these things form us and then we interpret life by them. Dallas Willard said it this way, we live from our depth, most of which we don't understand. And it is not given to us to go deep into introspection to figure it out. We simply come and say, Lord, you show me, you search me. The deep places within us are complex, it's often subtle, and they have a life of their own because it developed apart from the Lord. And so we invite him to penetrate the very deepest layers of our being because he knows our depth and he knows how to reshape what has been misshapen. And we receive that work by faith. So our natural human life is invaded by his supernatural life and that changes everything. Everything can change because of the power and the presence of His resurrection. And it is vitally important to understand this, that within us, there is already a whole center. I think I said it a little different way a while ago, but there is already a whole center where Christ dwells and where from that complete whole place, His life will come up through every part of us. It takes time, it takes development. But if we invite Him, we're gonna find that's true. And amazingly, we're coming from an already complete place. We see all sorts of things that need to change and aren't yet, and yet He, he sees us and He sees that place within us that is already righteous, already whole, already complete. It's where His habitation is. Colossians 2.10 says that that He sees us as complete. Dallas Willard put it this way, our life in Him is whole and blessed, no matter what has or has not been done to us, no matter how shamefully our human circles of sufficiency have been violated, no matter, we have a whole place in us. 
That should give us such great hope. St. Augustine, drawing from the Song of Solomon, put it this way, He looked through the lattice of our souls and spoke us fair. He sees us as his fair ones. We're his fair ones. We're complete and yet we're still in formation. God has already implanted real good within us, real good. And we don't have to strive for this, but we do have to receive it and we do have to collaborate with his healing and forming work in us. So after our salvation, spiritual formation is an automatic and it is not easy. When Paul was arrested by the Holy Spirit on the road to Damascus, he spent years, he had some wilderness experience, he had to get to know the other apostles. He spent years in preparation. He spent years with the Lord teaching him, and I think probably unteaching him a lot of religious things. Um, and he was tested and he was baptized again and again in the truth before he was mature enough to be anointed into the ministry. So, you know, we aren't always aware of what we need. We aren't always aware of what's going on in the inside and what is really influencing our thinking below the surface of our consciousness, even unremembered by us. But God remembers and He knows what is unseen, He knows what is unnoticed, and He knows what's unfinished. And only He knows every hidden dimension and has the power to change us from the inside out. So the more He helps us to see, and understand where we're disconnected, then the more we can cooperate with the Holy Spirit and, and say, yes, come change me. And he will bring light to our broken places. Like a good doctor, he initiates a cleansing process that begins to get the infections out. So when we ask him to come and heal us, there are some areas that he will pinpoint. And I just wanna mention four of these. Today, they're not all inclusive, but um, things to consider. The first is we're gonna have to face our inner anxiety. We're gonna have to let it come up so that we can process the pain that's behind it, the pain that's been driving it. And anxiety will propel us toward addictions if we don't find the pain that's behind it. I'll talk about addictions at a later time. That deeper pain that's been feeding the anxiety and depression can be healed, but we're gonna to have to stop whatever we're doing to numb it, sometimes cover it with busyness and so on, and really sit with the Lord and invite Him into that anxiety. The second thing we're gonna to have to face is anger. <laughs> anger is our reaction to perceived injustices. And sometimes we're taught to be good Christians and good Christians aren't supposed to be angry. But anger is, is a gift from God. It's just one of the emotions. And it we get angry when there's injustice. And so where we have repressed anger, our anger, maybe we didn't understand it at the time, or we have refused to admit it, even anger toward God. And sometimes we'll be angry and we'll pretend we're not angry and we'll just transfer that onto someone else and pretend they're the angry ones. But we're gonna to have to face our anger. We're gonna to have to face our thoughts about the injustice. The third thing is we're gonna to have to face our grief. Grief is just misery from loss and misery from heartache. But grief is actually God's healing and cleansing process. As we go through pain, we let go of the loss and letting go of the lost, now our hands are open and empty to receive those new things that God is bringing. The fourth thing is forgiveness. We're gonna to need to forgive. You know, pain isn't optional in this life, but, but bitterness really is. And when we forgive, when we let go of offenses, when we let go and relinquish our right for vengeance, then we're gonna cancel that debt and extend good toward another, extend mercy toward another. And this is what really opens us up to God's healing and blessing. The moment we will to forgive, God pours His strengthening into us. And we can stand free from the pain that others have caused us if we'll forgive. Forgiving others, forgiving ourselves, is really fundamental to our growth. To not forgive is a barrier. Um, if 
we choose to forgive, it means we are not allowing our offender to shape us. We are not allowing ourselves to be their victim in that sense, but rather we're looking, we're anticipating that God will bring us His favor. And we're taking responsibility really for our own emotions and uh, for our own reactions and deciding we're not gonna be a victim. We really can rewrite our history by collaborating with the Lord on this and making a choice to forgive and bless those who've wounded us. So those are just four areas to consider as we're moving along in this study. So as I mentioned, we are a soul. We don't have a soul, we are a soul. And then as we come into relationship with the Lord, His Holy Spirit comes to inhabit us and to give us new life and help us actually build a soul, form our soul. He, he gives us the capacity to be like Him in a very real way as we build our lives on Him. Oswald Chambers wrote in My Utmost for His Highest, many of us prefer to stay at the threshold of the Christian life instead of going on to construct a soul in accordance with the new life God has put within. We fail because we're ignorant of the way we are, we are made. And that's exactly what I want to talk about. How are we made? Let's not be ignorant. Let's understand that so we can partner with God in the construction of our soul. And we can understand how to move with Him and how to let Him move in that. Uh, I believe that he used that language, construct a soul, because we do have to build a soul around Christ. We have to develop it. And sometimes we have to just deconstruct what has been constructed in our soul in our early life by others or sometimes even by our own sin. We have to develop one while deconstructing the other. And Dallas, Dallas Willard calls this a carefully cultivated heart. I like that. We cultivate our heart, our soul, as He is remaking us. And as He empowers us in this, then we take responsibility for constructing our life around what He's showing us in obedience. And we need to understand that we really can do this. It really is possible. Colossians 2, 6 and 7 says, You receive Christ Jesus the Master. Now live in Him. You're deeply rooted in Him. You're well constructed upon Him. God has already implanted real good within us. He's already rooted us. He's given, a, given us a foundation we can build on. And we don't have to strive for this. We, but we do have to receive it and we do have to believe this is our part. Uh, we have this collaborative work to do with the Holy Spirit. Proverbs 24, 30, 31 says, I went past the field of a sluggard, past the vineyard of someone who has no sense. Thorns had come up everywhere. The ground was covered with weeds and the stone wall was in ruins. What a picture of a ruined soul. Sometimes we just, you know, things have been so destroyed in the sanctuary of our soul that we just have these ruined places that God has to restore for us. But we can arise and tend our hearts and cultivate and be restored. And we do have a responsibility to take possession of our own souls. Um, Luke, I believe it's... Uh, Luke 19 or Luke 21 talks about that, taking possession of our own souls. But a lot of times we don't take possession of our own souls because we don't even understand the connection between how we act and how we think, between the hidden unconscious parts of us and the conscious parts and all the interdependent faculties of our soul. But He wants us to understand and He wants us to pursue Him in this because He's constantly working to reform us. He sees every ruined place. He sees everything we missed. He sees every pain and He can identify it for us. So the key to transformation is trusting Him in this and the fullness of knowing Him as He is and knowing He is within us, knowing His goodness. The wonderful news is that everything wrong about us died on the cross with Jesus. I'm going to say it again. 
everything wrong about us died on the cross with Jesus. We don't have to make our own righteousness. In the cross and in the resurrection, we have been given everything we need for this transformation. It's the mystery of his indwelling. Dallas Willard called this spiritual formation, and he said spiritual formation refers to the spirit-driven process of forming the inner world of the self in such a way that it becomes like the inner being of Christ. This is interactive. It's the Holy Spirit in us, in us in Him. Uh, he's taking the initiative, but it's a very active process. In spiritual formation, we have our part. For example, uh, one, of, one of the things we do is we earnestly pray. Lord, I see this in me, you've shown me. Change me, help me to overcome this. Rearrange what's going on in my soul and heal me. And then we find he loves those prayers. He loves to answer them. And by grace, he comes in and answers, and then we can move forward with what he's showing us. John 14, 21 puts it this way. The person who has my commandments and obeys them is the one who loves me. And the one who loves me will be loved by my Father, and I will love him and reveal myself to them. To those who obey him, there is an intimacy that develops between us and the Lord, where we know we're known, we know we're loved, and we know we know and love in return. And he discloses himself to us. So beautiful. J.I. Packer wrote, all my knowledge of Him depends on His sustained initiative in knowing me. I know Him because He first knew me and continues to know me. So when we are reconnected to the Holy Spirit, we have power beyond anything that we can know or imagine. We really do. Scripture tells us that in Ephesians 3. Our true self has this incredible capacity for growth, for creativity, and for maturity. Uh, but we also have a competing imposter within us who covers and hides and presents a false front. And no foundation in Christ can be uh, built on the false. So that's why Jesus said in Matthew 10, 38 and 39, we have to lose our old life to find the new one. We have to die to our way of seeing and believing and living and choose his way. Willard says there is a developmental order in the soul such that if it does not receive what it needs to receive within appropriate periods of time as it grows, its further progression toward wholeness is permanently hindered. That's except for the power of grace intervening. If we don't receive, say, from our parents what we need uh, to learn to develop trust or to mature in our conscience, you know, what ho hope do we have? But when we meet Christ, He comes into those areas and lifts us up. And the, the good things that we have missed, we can have. And the things in our past that have caused us to turn a certain wrong way or develop all sorts of wrong roads we have gone down, uh, where we then become misshapen or stunted in our growth or broken down in pain and have all these residual effects, He comes to redeem. Our souls are complex and these internal maps we've constructed don't lead us to health and wholeness. Uh, as we understand this and lean into His ways as He brings us the truth, we can come out of our denial, we can come out of our confusion and we can begin to really build this house this soul. And um, as each part of our soul then gets healed and starts growing our will, our mind, our emotions, our conscience, and starts working together, we begin to see real wholeness. He, the Holy Spirit, knows what He's about as He keeps drawing us forward. And it may at times seem very confusing to us or uh, unorganized to us, but He knows what He's about. 2 Corinthians um, 3.18 says, right now we're seeing dimly, but we really are being transformed from glory to glory. It's the work of His presence within us. Leanne Payne wrote, the gifts of His presence, the power to know, to say, to act 
is ours, and we become the masterpieces of harmony God intended us to be. So in these videos, I'm gonna address the different parts of our soul. That way we can understand what's amiss in our soul and how we are to function. We can ask God for healing so that things really are set right within us and ordered well within us. And then we can cultivate wholeness and continued growth. Father Jacques Philippe wrote, only God is capable of creating totally unique masterpieces, not according to our own ideas, but according to what God actually wants of us. So when we're governed by the Holy Spirit, he leads our faculties, our senses. Uh, we're inclined to the movements of His Holy Spirit within us. And His, His presence gives us the capacity to submit to Him, to repent where we need to, to forgive, to receive His grace and His love so that everything within us can thrive. Whatever true that was quelled now becomes freed, enhanced, and alive and we begin to develop a solid perception of who we are and have our own sense of well-being. So I would like to just close in prayer. And as I do, I would also like to invite you back to the next video. Uh, video two will be about that faculty called the will. All right, so let's pray. Father, we thank you so much for encouraging us today. And as we begin this study, we know the Holy Spirit is our guide, our counselor, our comforter, our exhorter, the one who leads us into all truth. And the Holy Spirit is the one who resurrects everything within us that's dead or waning or misshapen. Thank you we have that hope, Lord. We ask you to set your fire within us during this time, Lord, and to burn away the old, and to burn into us the new. Enlighten within us your truth. Heal us. Make our feet sturdy to be able to walk in the new paths with you. Draw us to you that we may run together, Lord, that we may know your love and healing as never before. And what we've known in measure, Lord, would you make it possible for us to know in fullness Set in us a holy expectancy in these weeks that you are meeting us. You're revealing what's hindering, where the brokenness is, and you're revealing your glorious presence to heal us. Change us, Lord Jesus, change us. Make us whole in your wholeness. This is such good news that everything bad in us has died in the cross and that you have implanted real good within us and that there is within us a whole center and that your life will radiate up into every part of our soul, making a way for us to be transformed. We receive you. We receive your love, Lord. We thank you for the cross. We thank you the, for the power of your resurrection lives. And in these days, we ask you to help us see the capacity in every part of our soul where the healing is needed and grant us the faith to believe you are giving us all that's needed. Enliven us with your presence, Lord. Build your home in us, even according to John 15, that you are the vine and we are the branches. We want to collaborate in this construction. So we ask you to expand our capacity, make our foundation sure. Let us mature and thrive in you. We want a holy discontent. We don't want to stay as we are, Lord. We want to move forward in your fullness. So thank you that you're going to highlight any areas in our past or our present that we may need to be free from because you're making us into your masterpiece of harmony. You're restoring our true voice and we commit our whole being, body, soul, and spirit to, into your hands and into this work. We believe your redemption. We thank you in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, amen.